Um, thanks for having us. Um, we're going to get us started here today, and I really appreciate everyone coming out. I know it's the end of the day. It's a long talk, a uh, long day. What we're going to talk about is our program called Chariot, and we're going to learn what that stands for in just a second. But before we get into that briefly, we have no disclosures. Um, we are a philanthropic organization. We are very reliant on um, very generous corporate and private donors, but we are agnostic in terms of hardware, software, and we're very fortunate to have created great relationships with um, many different groups, specifically, um, and especially Luke here at Waitlist, who's really helped us with a, a lot of our software development. So before we get too into it, I want to describe the problem and why we're here today. Um, we are both uh, pediatric anesthesiologists, so what that means is we put children to sleep um, prior to having surgery. And unlike an adult who kind of understands it's time to have surgery, I'm going to go, I'm going to have an IV placed, and then after the IV is placed, I'm going to go to sleep, children have no idea what's going on. They're in an un unfamiliar environment. They're meeting a bunch of new strangers that, that are, no matter how nice we, we try to be, they're very much just naturally scared of physicians in general. And then they're going to have something painful done to themselves, such as a surgery. Um, so what you see here on, on, on the slide in front of you is not an uncommon uh, scenario. That's actually my daughter. Her name is Charlotte. Um, in this particular situation, she was crying because I simply asked, um, can I take your picture? Um, <laughs> this was for one of our photo shoots. So I can't even imagine what it would have been like if we actually, um, she actually had to have surgery. Um, <laughs> um, quickly, that's Sam's son who is so adorable and doesn't cry like Charlotte. So he's very fortunate. Um, <laughs> So why do we address pediatric fear and anxiety? The reason why is because prior to um, having a procedure, having surgery, if something is very distressing and those fears are not ameliorated, what can happen is that post-operatively, after they go home, they develop nightmares, sleep terrors, they may develop further separation anxiety, and they actually can sometimes report pain as being worse than it really is. And uh, if anyone in this room has children, you probably recognize just bringing your child to the doctor's office is sometimes very challenging, not to mention a hospital. Um, so that is the main focus of what we're doing. What is the CHARIOT program? It's beyond, besides being the best acronym you've ever seen, um, <laughs> CHARIOT stands for Childhood Anxiety Reduction Through Innovation and Technology. We like to throw pain in there because we know that when you reduce anxiety, you can reduce the subjective feeling of pain. And what do I mean by that? I mean, what I mean by that is, if I were to come up to you and say, hey, I'm about to hit you with this hammer in the side of your leg, okay? You're, you're gonna start to get anxious. So why is this guy gonna hit me with a hammer in the side of my leg? I don't know, this is probably gonna hurt a lot. And then I do it, and you're gonna say, ow. And then later on in the day, you're gonna have a bruise. Now. I bet you almost everyone in this room can relate to a time where at the end of the day, you got home, you're getting dressed to go to bed, and you look down and say, where'd that bruise come from? And you're like, I don't know, it must have ran into a door at some point today. And you didn't even register that during the day because your attention was focused elsewhere. And so we manipulate and exploit this phenomenon that your attention and your focus to stimuli, whether it be painful or not, can actually alter how you report the pain. So we're going to, I'm going to pass this over to Sam now, talk about how we're building a toolbox to better um, distract children so they report less pain. So one of the things that uh, Dr. Caruso was mentioning was that uh, we do work with children, and we work with children of all different shapes and sizes. So uh, we may see a two-month-old for our first case, and then the second case is an 18-year-old who weighs you know, 350 pounds. Um, so each of those uh, children need to be treated differently. And we see a variety of clinical situations. Some kids are coming in for an elective tonsillectomy where they're having their tonsils out. Um, some kids are coming in for you know, life-altering uh, heart surgery or brain surgery. So we've realized over time, it didn't take too much time, uh, that uh, it, this was not a one-size-fits-all uh, intervention uh, when we're focusing on pediatric pain and anxiety. Um, we've gone and we've We've used this uh, term of building a toolbox so that we have a variety of different software and hardware interventions for treating different size children, different 
different personality types for different clinical scenarios. We started using a term called the spectrum of immersivity, and the idea is that there's an ideal level of immersion for each clinical situation and each, uh, each uh, type of child. So what you might see is that uh, some kids are very calm. They don't need too much help. They might be fine with a few well-timed jokes uh, or just some smartphone applications. Other kids may benefit from some immersive video projection. Augmented reality may be a more appropriate for kids, especially that those that want to watch the procedures or get comfort from seeing their peers or their parents. And finally, virtual reality, which we do use a fair amount for kids who want to know nothing about what's going on and want to be completely immersed. And the sight of a needle makes them want to pass out. We use a variety of technologies uh, from a hardware standpoint. Most of these do require significant adaptation to be suitable for the clinical environment, which means that we rip out pads, we get rid of straps, we uh, build our own cases so that these technologies can be clean from infection st control standpoint, as well as survive the hostile hospital environment. Not only do we have to make adaptations to the hardware, we've started uh, designing our own software with the help of Luke Wilson. Um, we now make a lot of our own uh, VR experiences. We're making AR experiences. And we actually have developed our own uh, user interface for the Samsung Gear VR uh, that uh, allows us to control the content, uh, track a little bit of uh, analytics, and even put in some fun things like uh, being able to, uh, to alter the cognitive load. So a kid's getting an IV, for example, they're in a calm state in their penguin game. And right before we put the IV in, we tap the side of the headset. They go into turbo mode for 12 seconds, or groovy mode, Pebbles of Penguins groovy yeah. mode. And now they're inc the idea is that they're more engaged. They're we're occupying more of their cognitive load, and there's less room to focus on the needle poke. Uh, other important uh, aspects that we've uh, come to realize from doing this on thousands of children is that we want to do no harm. That's the number one principle. So we can't have kids puking and vomiting and fainting and having seizures. So we screen kids carefully. Um, when we build content, uh, Luke can talk about more about this in the Q&A, um, we uh, have built in a lot of parameters to reduce nausea, such as uh, a lot of times objects are coming towards the user rather than the user moving uh, we do a lot of stuff from third-person viewpoint. We try to have a positive message for everything we do. We also avoid fail states. So the worst thing that we can do in virtual reality is a kid's about to get, uh, you know, have an uh, extremely painful dressing uh, change. And right before we do that, the kid gets eaten by zombies in a virtual environment. And now they're dead in a virtual environment. And we're about to rip a dressing off their leg and cause excruciating pain. So we can't have fail states. We can't have the games end right, ab right before we're going to uh, start a painful stimulus. We also make sure that they're very, very easy to learn. Uh, healthcare may be, it's probably the most inpatient environment uh, that you'll work in. So if people ask me, you know, how long can it take to set this up? And if it takes longer than 30 seconds, you're, you're, people are just not going to use it. So our, our, the way we build our software is that Anyone can throw on these headsets and know the basics of how to use it without, with almost no instruction. I'll talk briefly about our first foray into immersive technologies, which was the Bedside Entertainment and Relaxation Theater, the BERT unit. It's a, uh, it's a smart projector that we've uh, customized for a stretcher. So uh, you can see there, there's a two foot by three foot screen at the foot of the bed. And uh, this is a ZTE S Pro or Spro 2 projector at the head of the bed. Uh, we do, let's play a little video here. We do passive content so kids can watch movies while they're being wheeled through the hallway or to surgery. Um, we also started designing some active content where they can participate in games. So this young girl is about to have a kidney biopsy. She's been very, very anxious in previous procedures because she's had a lot of them. And she was a perfect candidate for our SIVO, the dragon game. SIVO stands for SIVO fluorine, our most common inhalational anesthetic. So the first part of the game, she gets to pick a color of a dragon. We realize that it's really important to give kids some element of choice in an environment where they're losing all control. 
So I think she picked the blue dragon. They get to pick a food, so dragons love tacos, so she got a taco. And so she's learning how to play this game as she's wheeling through the hallway. You can see there's no interruptions here um, in order to make sure that she's continuously engaged. And now we're talking her through what's called an inhalational induction of anesthesia, where we put a mask on her. We have her take some deep breaths initially with nitrous oxide, which is uh, laughing gas, which doesn't have any smell. She gets a little bit stoned off of that. Then we titrate in our stronger gases, such as sevoflurane. She has no idea what's going on. She's actually breathing into the mask and cooking tacos uh, with her uh, projected dragon there, and she goes off to sleep. This mom's act, the mom's with her actually helping to hold the mask, and uh, the mom's actually laughing as her child goes to sleep during one of the most stressful moments of her entire life. So this has been a very successful project for us. Uh, Tom can talk about uh, some of the data that we found when we started doing this. Sure, so um, in the hospital environment, uh, unfortunately, even though we know something is working, we see the family and patients laughing, uh, the administration and others always want to see, show me the data, um, is this really worth it? So we looked at midazolam use, which is a drug that we sometimes give patients to help take the edge off. It's kind of, kind of like taking uh, in a little shot, like you know, a whole six pack of alcohol or something. It works on the same receptors in your brain, so it really mellows you out. Um, but most parents would prefer their, par their children not have midazolam if we can avoid it, but they also don't want them to be super anxious. So over a three month period before and after the BERT launch, we actually were able to half our midazolam use preoperatively. It was really cool because you'd see this like kid freaking out and the nurses and family and physicians would be like, oh yeah, it's time, let's give some midazolam. I was like, hold up, let's put it on the, the BERT projecting, projector unit. And uh, all of a sudden, they're totally into this movie, this experience, and um, they feel totally at ease. Um, we also looked at um, one of our surveys uh, at how happy parents were at, at their visit. And what we found that when we, after we loaded, uh, launched BERT, we had this unusual spike up in our likelihood to recommend metric, which is a very important metric for the hospital. Um, there, there's always ongoing pro uh, other projects happening, so there could be some confounders, but this was an unusual spike upwards. Um, so we thought that it all went along pretty nicely. Um, moving along the spectrum of immersivity, let's talk a little bit about virtual reality. Um, we'll just jump right into a video here. Um, we use virtual reality in a number of settings. Um, those in which, is this, is this playing? Wait a second. Click on that one. Playing? Click on the bottom left. Yeah. There it goes. Um, in a number of settings, uh, we use it in perioperative setting prior to surgery. We use it in patients undergoing wound uh, dressing changes. Uh, we have patients who are having uh, casts removed, casts remodeled, uh, abscesses being drained. And here's one of our patients, Miles, perhaps one of our um, greatest, um, I wish I could. He's the greatest that. Space Burgers player ever. To yeah, 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 I just want to see if I can get sound. No, I'm not going to get sound. Um, so uh, Miles had to have these dressing changes done daily. They're extremely painful, okay? You'll see sometimes when children have horrible uh, accidents, it just takes some time for it to heal. And his hospital stay at this point was mostly to have his dressings changed. He was playing one of the experiences that we did, developed called Space Burgers. Um, that little demo doesn't show what happens next is like hamburgers float by and french fries and the kids get a real kick out of it. Um, Miles was shooting for 1,000 points. Most kids get about 100 points. Um, and with, the, um, <laughs> with this use of the virtual reality for his dressing changes, he was actually able to go home probably a little bit earlier than he would have had to otherwise. His parents um, actually got a headset um, for him to use at home because they were going to need to do um, ongoing dressing changes. Um, so that's just one real life example of how we uh, use virtual reality. And so Miles had, his initial injury was he had his foot run over by a car. He'd have 10 surgeries. Every time that kid came in for surgery, he would be screaming and crying and it was a nightmare. He was requiring narcotic medications, benzodiazepine medications for every time he had to have a dressing change, which were sometimes multiple times in a day. And he's probably one of, one of our most successful patients because he went to using all these medications and still having a horrible experience to using nothing. He was so successful that we sent him home with a, with a headset uh, that he used at home for his ongoing wound care. And then once he was done and he was fully recovered, they, uh, the family brought the headset back to the clinic so that we could re, uh, repurpose it for other children. 
And this is another a similar story. Uh, this patient was a uh, go-kart racer, and he got his, uh, basically his jacket got caught in the axle of his go-kart, and he had what's called a degloving injury, so all the skin came off his right arm there. And so he also had to have many, many, many dressing changes, um, and he also similarly, similarly to Miles was having a lot of problem with anxiety and pain, require, requiring a lot of different medications. So here he is. Um, I think he's playing an underwater adventure uh, experience right now. And if we had sound, you'd hear a uh, provider in the background saying, OK, so what do you see now? Do you see the whale? And trying to reorient his attention into the virtual reality ex experience and take his attention away from the painful dressing change that's about to occur there. And we just saw Blaine uh, the other day at, at one of our talks, and uh, he's fully recovered. He's racing go-karts again. You can follow him on Twitter or whatever. Um, he's like, he lives for go-kart racing. And uh, he was, we were so happy to see that he had made uh, basically a full recovery after a very, very dramatic uh, injury. Right, it was a very uh, touching experience. Um, and then you'll see, well, this is kind of just goes over exactly what we just said and he was no longer required anesthesia for these dressing changes, which is pretty amazing. Um, some children, the pain is so bad that they need to have uh, anesthesia. So we study this as well, virtual reality. We study virtual reality for vascular access. So vascular access in this situation um, refer to having a blood draw, refer to having a port, like a chemo port for cancer patients access, which is another needle stick, or um, having an IV placed. We looked at over 100 patients at a prospective randomized trial. And what we saw that are um, measured by compliance, meaning is a child screaming, crying, and pulling away? And this is very sad, the things we have to do to children. Oftentimes, we have to literally hold them down while doing an IV while they're screaming and crying, and that's obviously not ideal. Um, and so we had a significant um, increase in our compliance when children were using virtual reality. I'm just going to add one thing in there. Vascular access, so IVs and blood draws, is one of the most, is probably our most common use case for virtual reality in the hospital. I wouldn't say it's the most effective use case, though. Um, because the pain scores with vascular access are very small. Uh, needle poke, kids usually have a pain score about 1 to 2 out of 10. But there are some very anxious, very fearful um, kids who have very high pain scores with it. And it's very hard to show in the research the impact virtual reality can have for some of these kids where it takes a very escalated experience and turns it into something that's sometimes even pleasant. So when you look at studies around vascular access and virtual reality, the data is very, very mixed in terms of what you see. Does it affect pain scores? Does it affect fear and anxiety? Because for most kids, it makes the experience a little bit better, um, or it only has a mild effect on pain scores. But there's a small subgroup, which is very hard to capture in, in research, of kids that it has a, a potentially clinically altering experience in a positive way. And that last video, video you guys just saw was um, a new application of virtual reality that we've been doing, which is actually completely eliminating anesthesia entirely. Um, the child in this procedure is having an insertion of a, um, a small uh, medicine into her arm. And essentially, she would have otherwise had to have had anesthesia for this. Um, and said she came in, used the virtual reality, and was completely um, fine having her anxiety distracted. Yep, so um, she had, uh, she's had three to four anesthetics for this exact procedure in the past. It's an implant that goes into her arm and has to be removed every year. Uh, and she transitioned from needing general anesthesia to doing this with virtual reality. And there are some very, very motivated kids that, uh, that can do this. Our program has grown to not just a clinical program, but we now provide education for other uh, does those lights mean our time's running out, or is it just? So we have no idea what just happened. No problem. That's OK. <laughs> we'll just keep talking until you guys walk out. We only have a few more slides. <laughs> uh, we've grown from a primarily a clinical program to uh, having a, a pretty big research, program, research footprint um, in terms of innovation, especially with the help of people like Luke Wilson. Uh, we have become innovators in this field in both uh, software design and some of our uh, hardware customization. 
We do do a lot of work with education. That includes uh, students at our university, uh, trainees at our hospital. We give talks at other hospitals. We even give some talks at, uh, at technology conferences to, so that we can better educate uh, people who are in this field about the unique uh, needs of the healthcare environment. Uh, our program has grown a little bit. We're mostly focused on our hospital, but uh, because of our success, other places have uh, reached out to us, and we do help them uh, periodically implement some of, the, some of the successful technologies that we've used in other parts of the country, and we have a couple international uh, projects ongoing. We have lots of stuff going on, including, inclu um, and things that we've already completed are, are developing our own custom interface and experience. Uh, one of the huge uh, efforts that we uh, are working on is, is formalizing clinical protocols. So not just building the software, you know, adapting the hardware, but how do we actually implement this in a protocolized fashion in a hospital environment and make it reproducible when Tom or I are not there or in other hospitals, which is, which is a very important component uh, in which we've, we're continuously working on. Uh, we did do a, a hospital-wide launch through mostly our child life department, but we do have strategic locations that function in terms of virtual reality without child life. We are expanding throughout the, chi the Stanford Children's Network. Uh, we do have some national partners. Uh, our next big effort is taking what we're learning in the acute pain, acute distraction realm, and uh, applying that and some, uh, and some new uh, techniques to the chronic pain and physical therapy uh, uh, arm. We already have a space that's dedicated for virtual reality physical therapy, and we are working on building content and, and, and working with partners on that. And then we do have uh, some augmented reality pilots. This is one of our older ones using the Microsoft HoloLens, which is not an ideal hardware, but uh, we've had a couple of cases where it's come in handy. This guy's an 11-year-old who has, uh, he's kind of on the autistic spectrum, so he's got some difficulty interacting with others. Perfect candidate for virtual reality because he hates IVs. He's got, uh, he's always been a very challenging IV in the past and actually requires ultrasound. So we're like, let's use the virtual reality. And he said, no, I want to be able to see what's going on. I want to be able to see my mom. So we use some augmented reality software that uh, we built with one of our partners. And he had like what he thought was the best IV he's ever had. He's smiling through it. You'll be able to see his mom and even his surgeon like smiling in the background. He's interacting with some uh, robots that play some games with him, teach him a little bit about IVs if he wants to do that. That's his aunt right there. And then his mom and his surgeon are over here laughing while he's getting poked with a needle with the ultrasound. So like we discussed in the spectrum of immersivity, this was a kid who was ideal for a technology-based distraction intervention for his procedure, um, but was not quite on the VR end of the spectrum. He needed to be scaled back towards the AR uh, area. Um, we can take some questions now, because I think we're exactly on time. Um, and so Tom, myself, and Luke Wilson uh, will be available. Luke can handle some of the more uh, software, technology, heavy questions, if any of those do come up. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah, so um, I work in the healthcare space, and I'm sure in addition to the, the outcome of the dissatisfaction of the children, have you also had any research on um, nurse care, like is reduced hours of nursing, better <laughs> outcomes, better feeling? Was some of those also measured for, uh, for nurses? We are... Yes, so the question was, have we looked at nursing outcomes, such as nurse satisfaction, reduced hours, maybe ease of work, something along those lines. We're actually starting to utilize some clinical informatic nurse specialists as uh, VR super users within the hospital, but so far none of our actual uh, data, data that we've collected have focused on the nursing experience. They've mostly focused on the patient experience, because we have had this question before as well, not just nurses, but also physicians or child life providers. How are they liking deploying this technology? But so far, it's been very patient-centric, the measures we've been looking at. Um, nurses are, are a key component in terms, of, in terms of building a clinical, scalable program, uh, because we rely very heavily on child life specialists, and what, that's what you're going to see at most children's hospitals, where those are available. Um, but they're, not a, they're a limited resource. And so 
we anticipate that there's going to be, at our hospital and other hospitals, a need for kind of nurse advocates, nurse super users uh, to help champion this technology in the different areas within hospitals. Yep, question in the back. So, uh, yeah, that was a great example of using, uh, using VR for wound care, uh, especially with dressing changes. That could be a very extensive process. Um, what's your, your content time that you're usually using? Because, I mean, a dressing change can go from five minutes to over an hour, depending on the size of the dressing and other things like that. Uh, you uh, yeah, so our, our average use case, uh, I would say, is between five and 15 minutes. And that's usually because, that's probably because Vascular access is our most common use case. It's one of the most common procedures in the hospital. That being said, like you're saying, we do have cases that go on for 40 minutes, for an hour. And in terms of our content, we're constantly working on you know, solutions for that. It's really expensive to build a game that lasts for an hour, right? So the games that we're building, they do repeat over time. Luke, how much unique content do we have? Yeah, we target for about 10 to 15 minutes of unique content per experience. Um, and then also, also a lot of the work that we've done has gone into building kind of our own uh, interface for changing between games. So we've completely bypassed the Gear VR Home, which is way too complicated. Um, and that allows our patients to switch between content on their own pretty easily. The final possible solution for what you're saying is uh, we, we do have the option, and we're, we're toying with uh, building playlists. So you can actually build a custom playlist for a child that would say, the kid's going to do 15 minutes of space burgers. If they're still in the procedure, then they go into like a passive uh, you know, scene or, or a movie or another game. And you can help actually build that with the child. But that's a great point. You, know, you can't have 15 minutes of content, and the procedure lasts for 25 minutes, and the kid's sitting there staring at a blank screen or a menu. Uh, yeah.